For the first time, we're hearing the chilling call from a woman who says a priest tried to kill her. Horribly, my hair is pulled out of my head. Her pleas for help and what's next in the case. Hundreds of thousands of partiers and bettors in town for the big game. Police are out in force to make sure we all stay safe on the roads. And a tragic accident leaves two workers dead, a third so contaminated, doctors had to take turns treating him. Now, your number one 11 p.m. newscast. Channel 8 Eyewitness News in HD. Trying to save their co-worker, two men risked their own lives and jumped into a sewer hole after him. An engineer was trying to fix a sewer pipe, but as he finished sawing, a torrent of water swept the tool out of his hands, and he fell in after it. His co-workers didn't hesitate to go in after him into the eight-foot hole. Channel 8 Eyewitness News is live. Melissa Duran joins us from near University Medical Center. Or Melissa. Well, Paula, the only survivor of this tragic accident was brought here early this afternoon to get help for his injuries. Now, just like the other two men who died, he was exposed to toxic fumes during what was supposed to be a normal day at work. Routine maintenance on a clogged pipe at the Orleans Hotel took a deadly turn for two employees. Clark County fire crews rushed out to the hotel after reports three men had fallen into an eight-foot deep sewer manhole. Rescuers say an engineer was cutting the pipe with a saw when the pipe burst. The water pressure, once that pipe broke through, hit the saw and knocked it out of his hand. He leaned forward to try to catch the saw. That's when he fell in. Two co-workers dove in after him. The toxic fumes inside knocked all three unconscious. The combination of hydrogen sulfide and methane gas can be lethal, yes. Fire crews believe the combination killed two of the employees. We're devastated. Um, just as a company, as an organization, as human beings. But one employee was still alive. They put a harness on him and basically winched him out of the hole feet first. Once they got him up, they found out that he was unconscious. They put him on the gurney and uh, they started giving him oxygen. That, that brought him around. He spent his night here at UMC, where doctors have worked feverishly to save him. Uh, but because of the fumes, basically, and the gas that is still in his body, uh, they're, they're basically having to, you know, almost rotate people around him to give him the medical care that he needs because he is extremely toxic. And while everyone waits to see if this employee makes it through, word of the tragic accident is already spreading through employees and friends at the Orleans Hotel. Right now, there has been no confirmation which of the three men actually survived this whole ordeal, whether it was the one who initially fell into the hole or one of the men who went in to save him. Right now, OSHA is investigating, but we do know that the sole survivor remains in extremely critical condition. Reporting live, Melissa Dunan, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. Melissa, working in such a hazardous area, were the crews able to get to the other two? Well, they actually were. The Clark County Fire Department tells me earlier today that they secured the scene and were able to pull the bodies out from the hole at about 8.30 this evening. Once the bodies were out, they decontaminated them right there on the scene and then were taken to the coroner's office. Thank you, Melissa. Clark County prosecutors are working to extradite Father George Shanine back to Las Vegas. For the time being, he is jailed in Arizona. Shanine is accused of attacking and sexually assaulting a woman one week ago, then fleeing the area. Tonight, for the first time, we are hearing the victim's terrified voice recorded the night of the attack in a 911 call. Michaelina Bellamy said Father George Shanine beat her with a wine bottle until it broke over her head. Then then she says he grabbed her by her hair, dragged her into another room, and began sexually assaulting her and choking her. All she could do was pray. But then he suddenly stopped, said he'd kill himself, and left. Police caught up with him in Arizona yesterday. On the tape, Bell Bellamy's voice is full of fear for her life. Help me. This is the fire department. What happened? Did you fall? No, I got beaten up. You got beaten up. Okay. Horribly. My hair is pulled out of my head. Okay. Where's the person who did this to you? I don't He's, he's going to kill himself. Where, where is the person who did this he's, to you? He left. Which way did he go? And you're bleeding from your head? I'm bleeding from everywhere. Bellamy wouldn't tell the operator who attacked her, but later she told police it was Shanine. Bail for Shanine is set at $1 million. He'll be back in court on Tuesday.
Well, it's Super Bowl weekend for Las Vegas, and before you leave your house the next few days, prepare to spend some more time on the roads. Even more people than last year expected to be in town. An estimated 287,000 should be visiting, which can mean dangers on the roads, but beware that police will be watching closely. Channel 8 Eyewitness News is live. Adrian Arambulo joins us from the Desert Inn Arterial. Adrian? Dave, police are expecting a lot of drunk drivers to be on the road on Super Bowl Sunday, from people leaving parties to tourists leaving the sports books. So a DUI checkpoint is going to be in effect, as are rowing patrols for those who want to gamble by drinking and driving. Las Vegas might be the second most attractive place to be for football fans on Super Bowl Sunday, other than the game itself. There will be plenty of parties on the strip and off. Instead of game tickets, fans can pick up betting slips. Police are betting there being a good number of drunk drivers on the roads post-game. In anticipation of that, we'll be doing uh, uh, a uh, DUI checkpoint on Sunday evening. It'll uh, begin right about uh, as the game is ending. We're looking for impaired drivers. How much have you had to drink tonight? But Super Sunday partiers beware. Police aren't giving away all their plans. We try to keep the location of the DUI checkpoints uh, uh, kind of uh, secretive so that uh, uh, people don't avoid that area just in case they were listening to your newscast. Police picked up yeah. dozens yeah. of drunk drivers. Every drunk driver we remove from the streets may be uh, a life that we save. And besides the checkpoint, highway patrol troopers will look to intercept intoxicated drivers in what they call saturation patrols. We're looking for any reason whatsoever to, to contact you and to, and to uh, ask you if you've been drinking, to smell inside of your car. If the risk of losing your life or costing someone else theirs is not enough to stop you from drinking and driving, consider this gamble. A best case scenario DUI down here in Las Vegas is going to cost you conservatively probably between uh, 10 and 12 grand. And to put this into and to put this into perspective, typically Super Bowl Sunday is the second deadliest day of the year on the roads when it comes to fatal traffic accidents with New Year's Day usually ranking first. Reporting live, Agent Arambulo, Channel 8, Eyewitness News. All right, Adrian. And a lot of money is going to be put down on this game. In fact, the amount gambled here in Las Vegas will equal the size of a lotto jackpot, about $100 million. I'm going to try to make a few bucks on those, just a few dollars here just or there. Just for fun? Just for fun, because it's, it's almost an impossible bet. And there are pages and pages of different kinds of bets that can be made. About 80% of the money bet in Las Vegas on the Super Bowl will likely be placed Saturday and Sunday. It's the biggest amount of money bet on a single game all year. The Air Force Thunderbirds will play a special role in the Super Bowl. The six F-16s will do a flyover of the stadium on Sunday, just as the national anthem wraps up before the game. Today, the Thunderbirds got an in-flight refueling from the Utah Air National Guard to help them make it all the way to Miami. The maneuver took place 25 5,000 feet over Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. The only place you can watch Super Bowl 41 is right here on Channel 8. The game starts at 3 o'clock, but the pregame show kicks off at 9 a.m. After the game, CBS will air Criminal Minds. Then at 8, Channel 8 will air a special behind-the-scenes look at Eyewitness News this morning. A tornado devastated parts of Central Florida last night, leveling areas in at least four counties. 19 people killed in the storm, and officials expect that number to rise. The tornado struck just after 3 o'clock this morning, giving people little time to react before it flattened homes, tore apart roofs, and set everything flying. I just rolled off the bed and held onto the carpet. And the next thing you hear, crash. That's my sink up there. My bathtub is over there. Unbelievable. Thousands were left without power after the storm. The governor there said he's doing everything possible to get aid to the areas. Dozens of cases of child neglect of children who are in the custody of the state. Is Child Protective Services really protecting the kids? Initially, we felt good because we were told all these things, you know, to don't worry that the kids are checked on once a month. But only the I-Team has the report that shows just how many times one foster home was checked. A two-year-old girl has been missing from that home since June, but should she ever have been put there in the first place? The shocking history coming up. And a sexual predator who preys on young girls is on the loose in Phoenix. And the parents are home at the time of the attacks. Find out how he gets to the kids.
Metro busted a theft ring in a rather unexpected place, an upscale guard-gated community. Police say the thieves were targeting their own neighbors. Only Eyewitness News went along as Metro robbery detail raided a house in Rhodes Ranch last night and arrested three suspects. What they found was more than $100,000 worth of jewelry, electronics, and expensive cars. They're terrorizing these folks at gunpoint. Um, they're making them go you know, through the house to, to find hidden valuables and things of that. That sort. Two of the suspects are juveniles, but they could be tried as adults. Detectives hope you'll remember something about this next incident. Four men reportedly struck a business in the 700 block of Eastern Avenue. It happened around 7.30 p.m. December 28th. The suspects told everyone to get down on the floor while they grabbed cash and merchandise. They took off in a black 1999 Dodge pickup truck. Call Crime Stoppers if you can help. Well, if the state senator has his way, English would become Nevada's official language. State Senator Bob Beers says having an official language would eliminate the need for providing government services in several languages. Beers says his proposed bill shouldn't be seen as an attack of immigrants. We're one of the few countries that doesn't have a, uh, an official language, although we really do. Uh, and uh, I think it's time we put it in law. The legislature kicks off Monday, and Eyewitness News has a crew in Carson City to bring you the latest from the state capitol. Daunting. That's the way a new report describes the situation in Iraq. A group of 16 U.S. spy agencies released the report that does include the phrase civil war when describing parts of the conflict. The White House says the intelligence estimate is proof that President Bush's troop surge is necessary. The Democrats say sending more troops into danger without a plan is not the answer. Former Vice President Al Gore was nominated today for the Nobel Peace Prize for his work to bring awareness to global warming. Meanwhile, at a conference on global warming, scientists made their strongest statement yet, agreeing that devastating droughts and deadly heat waves will get worse in coming years because the Earth's temperature is rising. They say only immediate action can reduce the effect, which they say is caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Two Arizona towns are on alert tonight after police say a serial child predator has struck numerous times. Police officers went door to door in Chandler, Arizona, handing out flyers of the suspected sexual predator. Three assaults have happened in that city, four in Phoenix, the youngest victim just three years old. This subject is most likely casing the areas before he's going to attack. We don't know if this individual is kind of just walking through the darkness, looking into windows. There is, like I said, there is some feeling that he spends some time targeting victims. Police say the suspect got into the houses through windows, and they say in every case an adult was home at the time of the crime, but was unaware it was happening. They're hoping the flyers help put him behind bars. Clark County is reviewing all 55 child welfare cases censored from a report presented to a blue ribbon panel. The I-team was first to bring you the story of the missing eight pages. The county said the re-review of the cases will be made public. Because of the original report, Family Services is undergoing a multifaceted overhaul. 64 new employees will be hired between now and April to handle the overflowing caseload. This overhaul comes too late for several children, including a toddler who vanished from her foster family's home. The foster parents claim two-year-old Everlise Cabrera somehow unlocked the front door and left the house in the middle of the night. A county report on the matter was kept secret until now. Channel 8 I-Team reporter Colleen McCarty has obtained it. Colleen. Well, this is another one of those uh, censored documents, mm -hmm. I guess you could say. And now that I've read it, I can understand why they don't want anyone to see it. Shortly after Everly's disappeared, the county asked a consultant to review its case files. According to the report, he did. He also interviewed CPS staff and medical personnel. Bottom line, little Everly shouldn't have been in that foster home in the first place. I might not be the best mom, but I'm not the worst mom either. Marlena Olivas makes no excuses for her mistakes. Her drug use led to the removal of her children, 11-month-old Benny and 2-year-old Everly's. I'd say, come here, mama, and she'd say, you come here, mama. That was my little nickname for her, still is my little nickname for her. While Marlena struggled to get clean, her kids bounced from child haven to a temporary shelter home to foster care. Initially, we felt good because we were told all these things, you know, to don't worry, 
that the kids are checked on once a month. You know, they do like the home inspections once a month. Um, and that, you know, they're highly recommended. The so-called highly recommended foster parents, Manuel and V. Carascal, licensed in June of 2005, their short stint in the child welfare system raised red flags early on. The Channel 8 I team has obtained a review of the Carascal foster home commissioned by the county after little Everly's Cabrera disappeared. And is this it? Independent consultant Ed Cotton wrote the report. This family had seven foster children and not a single caseworker ever went to that house until the day she disappeared. You know, since that hasn't been released, I, I don't feel comfortable talking about it at all. Neither does the county. It begins with a timeline. The first concern less than a month after the Carascal family receives their first child. They want the three-year-old out immediately. And when the county doesn't move fast enough, the family dumps the boy at Child Haven. Less than a month later, December 2005, a second foster child in the Carascal's care ends up in the emergency room. Allegedly burned by hot soup, the family waits eight hours before seeking medical attention. Second and third degree burns require a night in the hospital and a child protective services investigation is ordered. It never happens. The only follow-up, weeks later, a licensing investigator questions the foster mother and determines on her word alone, the burn was an accident. Over the next month, two other children move in, then out of the Carascal home, dumped just like the first boy in their care at Child Haven. Concerned by a lack of commitment, in January, the county puts a temporary hold on all placements in the Carascal home. By April, it's lifted and Benjamin and Everlise Cabrera move into the house on Diamond Point Court. A month later, the county renews the Carascal family's foster license, despite their failure to complete the required training. The licensing worker also notes, in hindsight, she knew nothing about the boy who'd been burned. We know that there's got to be someone out there somewhere. Two months later, Make sure we check all the houses. Everlise Cabrera disappears. It is the first time ever a caseworker sets foot in the Carascal home. Had they done their home inspections, you know, um, highly recommended or not, had they done their home inspections the way they were supposed to, maybe Everlease would still be here. Maybe. And though Marlena Olivas admits she's made mistakes, she never lost a child. And I, I'm never going to give up thinking that we're going to find her. That, to me, that's the hardest thing, is to imagine not ever getting her back. And I can't imagine that. Benny Cabrera, Everlise's little brother, was removed from the Carascal home when she disappeared. The county revoked the Carascal's foster license. Also troubling, the Carascals still refused to cooperate with police and have not spoken with them since the day after Everlise went missing. If you have any information about her disappearance, please call 1-800-THE-LOST. And we've put portions of this report on our website at lasvegasnow.com. Good work on covering this, Colleen. Thank you. Okay, it is uh, Groundhog Day today, yeah, and uh, we're is. told that Punxsutawney Field did, did not see a shadow, so that means winter's coming, uh, winter's Ending almost early. over. So yes, yes, spring is coming early. <laughs> yeah, let's let's let the warm-up begin. Let's go. Let the warm-up begin. First, though, we have to get through a very cold night tonight. Here's a look from the Rio camera, and well off in the distance, you can see the moon shining brightly. Barely any clouds out there this evening, although what that means is we will have radiational cooling, and it's already begun here in the valley. Temperatures in the 30s for most of us already, and it's not even at the coldest point it will get tonight. 39 degrees for North Rancho, 39 degrees for East Flamingo. A few 40s scattered about, but just everybody's dropping now into the upper 30s. And a look outside the valley, Pahrump already 20, 27 degrees already. And as we head through the remainder of not only tonight, but tomorrow as well, you're going to start off the day on the cold side. But then eventually we do have a warm up on the way and it's all thanks to this. An area of high pressure that's going to allow for cold weather tonight. Yet the same area of high pressure is going to allow for fabulously warm weather as we head through the upcoming week. Here's a look at the future cast. Starting off Saturday morning at 5 a.m., temperatures will be cold. Clear conditions, radiational cooling, allowing for the temperature at 7 a.m.
a.m. to only be 35 degrees in Las Vegas. Pahrump freezing, so you will be sub-freezing tonight. Laughlin close to 40 degrees, and then as we head through our Saturday, really it's going to be a beautiful day. Just a light breeze out there. Temperatures a little warmer than we were today. Henderson 60 degrees, Mesquite 60 degrees as well. Laughlin 62, Pahrump 55, and Las Vegas close to 60. You're almost there. Travel tomorrow. If you are going to Seattle, cloudy conditions, 46 for a high. Boston 34, so you're finally above the freezing mark in that area if that's where you're heading to. Mostly sunny conditions expected. Chicago snow. Denver looks great, but cold, 23 degrees. And LA temperature about 76 for tomorrow. If you are staying here, which we hope you are, air quality looks good tomorrow for dust, for ozone, and for carbon monoxide. Plus, as we head towards spring, we're getting more daylight. 640 is when the sun comes up, 509 is when the sun will set. And then we've got this for Sunday. How about that football? You like that? Kickoff in <laughs> Miami. Thunderstorms. Are, believe it or not, in winter, we may see thunderstorms in Miami. Breezy weather, too. Very unsettled. Temperature about 71 degrees on Sunday in Miami. And we are going to get close to that number as we head into Monday. Oh, oh, right. 70s coming back. Tuesday, 70s are sticking around. Then a small weather system could move through Wednesday through Thursday. But really, I mean, this is a great time nice. to be in Las Vegas. Very yeah, nice. love it. <laughs> okay, Thanks. Gina. You're welcome. Well, that's it for 10 Late Eyewitness News, live at 11. We turn it over now to Michael Burke for Sports Friday. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Coming up next on Sports Friday, the Rebels are in Provo, where 23,000 Cougar crazies are awaiting. And if you head over to the Thomas and Mac for a Gladiators game this season, you're going to be very disappointed. We'll explain. Sports Friday, back after this. Every month, Southern Nevada grows by 7,000 new people. 7,000 new beginnings, new expectations, and new dreams. Channel 8 is proud to be your station for the news you need to face our growing challenges and opportunities. Channel 8 Eyewitness News. It's not just news, it's your news. Channel 8 Eyewitness News, the first station in Nevada. Now, the first and only station broadcasting local news in high definition. Neighborhood weather on Channel 8 Eyewitness News in high def is brought to you by Finley Cadillac Saab. Hi everyone, welcome to Sports Friday. I'm Michael Burke. Super Bowl 41, now fewer than 48 hours from kicking off. The Bears and Colts both practice for the final time today, and they'll walk through their game plans tomorrow at Dolphin Stadium. It'll be a big day for Peyton Manning, the first Manning who can quarterback a Super Bowl champ. I'm proud of him. He's worked extremely hard to get here. He's paid his dues. He's been close a number of times, and and uh, you know he's finally you know he's made it to the Super Bowl. But that's only that's only half the battle. He's still got to go in there and, and try to get a win. Uh, no matter what happens, he's going to be thought of as a great quarterback in the league. You just you know you, you always hate to uh, to see he's a great quarterback, but he never had a championship. And Super Bowl 41 can be seen right here on Channel 8, kickoff 3.25 p.m. The 25th ranked running Rebels spent most of practice these last few days trying to execute with artificial crowd noise. Now that's a ploy used mainly by football teams, but with those BYU faithful at the 23,000 seat Marriott Center, UNLV can expect a loud, hostile environment tomorrow, not to mention a very good Cougars team. They came on so strong at the end of last year. You know, I don't think it's a big surprise this year. Last year, a little bit of a surprise because you know, not much was known going in. Uh, this year, a lot was expected of them, and uh, they, they've not disappointed. They've played very well. Rebels, BYU tomorrow in Provo, tip off at 2.30 on the mountain. Wranglers back on home ice for a three-game set with Toledo. Both goalies were outstanding tonight. So was the mascot. The goalies combined to make 57 saves for a regulation shutout. Shootout needed. And this goal from Nick Perillo, who beats Kevin Nastyuk with a wrist shot. 1-0 the final at the Orleans. Same two tomorrow on what will be NASCAR night, 7.05. The puck drops. And the combatants for tomorrow's UFC 67 card at Mandalay Bay weighed in today. Former Rebel football player Marvin Eastman came in at 203 pounds for his light heavyweight bout with Rampage Jackson. Boy, I'm not sure you want to mess with a Rampage Jackson. <laughs> Middleweight champ Anderson Spider Silva will fight at 185 pounds. Direct TV pay-per-view for tomorrow's live telecast. Still to come tonight on Sports Friday, first college hoops. Now this, the Orleans Arena just became home to another big Las Vegas event. Sports Friday. Back after this. 
Monday on Channel 8 Eyewitness News this morning. The best thing about the big game is the Super Bowl ads, and we're going to show you some of the best. Look forward to that. Plus, what's cool at school? Flag twirling at Bill Bray Elementary. We're going to take you there. We start at 5 a.m. Come see us. UNLV safety Jay Staggs among the All-Stars taking part in tonight's inaugural Texas First the Nation All-Star game. First half action, Montana quarterback, formerly of Washington State, Josh Swagger, never has a chance with Staggs in his face. Jay forces the fumble. It's eventually scooped up by the Nation. Very next play, the Nation would make him pay. Watch Ryan Moore get under this one. And then at his knees, he makes a nice little catch for six. Nation beats Texas 24-20, the final score. The Las Vegas Gladiators Arena Football League team isn't leaving Las Vegas, but it still has to fill out one of those change of address forms with the post office. Chris Matthews has more now. In sports, there is that home field advantage, which apparently hasn't been much of one for the Gladiators. Struggling on the field and at the gate, the team needed a change. So they moved. Kind of like the Colts in 1984, bolding from Baltimore to Indy, kind of. <laughs> well, I don't think it was quite like that because, you know, we had to go through a lot of hurdles with contracts and, of course, visiting with Damon and uh, Darren and uh, Mike Hamrick, and then also we had to get league approval. Instead of moving from one state to another, the Gladiators are moving from one home to another, from the Thomas and Mac to the Orleans Arena. Football season won't end on Sunday because of the Super Bowl. We'll continue to have football here at the Orleans Arena. The setting will be more intimate. Besides, trying to fill a 9,000 seat arena is much easier. I think it's a little more cozy. You know, it'll be a little better environment for the fans, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So. The league had to give Las Vegas permission to move into a smaller venue, but in this case, bigger wasn't necessarily better. It'd be a great way to showcase arena football with a packed arena and get the excitement, and that's what it's all about. Chris Matthews, Channel 8 Eyewitness Sports. For the score. Those who attended that Florida-Kansas basketball game earlier in the year at the Orleans Arena know how loud that place can get, so hopefully that the, the Gladiators have created a great home field advantage for themselves. Lembanker likes the Bears, plus the touchdown over the Colts. He actually likes the over-under at 45 points, but it's at 48 and a half. Either way, if you go with Lem and take the under and the Bears plus seven, you'll be in good shape. That's all the time we have for Sports Friday tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. David Letterman is next with David Spade. Enjoy the Super Bowl here on Channel 8.